And we decided, you know, you guys, I've, I've told you, you've suggested in the past we do some panel discussions. And we thought you know, one of the great ways that we could do panel discussions is to bring some of the other talent from Town Hall Media and get them on stage and, and get them involved in, in Red State's gathering. Uh, Kevin is an editor at townhall.com. Uh, many of you know Katie, who's also uh, with me on Fox, although she has a show on Fox that I hope you watch. And I, I'm going to sing some additional praise uh, of Katie that it was not requested and is probably not expected, but, but I want to say this. I get books on a daily basis from every publishing house in America. And there is a trend in these books. They are, most of them now, young conservatives, particularly young female conservatives, who write these fly-by-night books you won't remember tomorrow, and they're just not very good. And this, I, I just, I've got to really tip my hand as someone who wrote a, a just awful book. It was the most painful experience of my life. Katie Pavlich has, has written the best book on Fast and Furious that you will find, the one that I still refer to on a regular basis on my radio show, uh, that is not one of those fly-by-night pop culture conservatism books that are out on the market. It's actually a substantive, detailed book that documents the problems. It's not the only thing she's written, and I just, I have to, as someone who has been there and done that, and now sees the dreck that comes across my desk every day, to, to thank her and commend her for not being one of those authors. She is just, it's fabulous. And I don't mean to downplay Kevin, but I just, I see so much of what goes in conservative media these days, and I'm so proud of Katie and, and her success and the ability to write a book that so many people still quote from when it comes to Fast and Furious and, and other things. And I'm delighted that both of them can be here. And I'm just going to hand it over to them and let them discuss the Obama scandals. It's really exciting to be in a room full of the people who are doing all of the hard work to get conservative principles back into the public conversation. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. And uh, thanks to Eric for bringing together such an intense and energetic community of people. It's really amazing um, what I've seen here today. This is my first Red State gathering. So um, most of you are more uh, experienced than I am. But <laughs> I, this is my first Red State <laughs> gathering as well, so we're kind of in it's very exciting. It's very exciting. Um, Katie and I, we work together at Town Hall, as Eric said. Our offices are literally right next to each other, so this discussion might be one that we would have every day, actually, in the Town Hall offices, <laughs> and now you guys get to listen in. There's more uh, yelling, though, that goes on, <laughs> you know. We have walls because things get thrown. They just seem to get Yeah, yeah the so. throwing, yeah. Yeah, throwing um, happens. But I'm sure that everyone in this room can kind of go down a list of the Obama scandals because you people are all informed and it's amazing to see exactly how much knowledge you bring to the table. Um, we've seen it in the Q&A sessions today. But first off, uh, Katie, I wanted to kind of ask you what your thoughts are on how all of these Obama scandals have proliferated and kind of what makes these Obama scandals so susceptible in the administration. Right, so I think it's important since President Obama has been around for a while now, we've been in this administration for six years, to kind of go through a list of what we would call uh, scandals inside the Obama administration, because there have been so many of them, and we won't be able to cover them all today because we would be here all night, uh, as we know. But I think it's important to remind people of you know, what those scandals have been and what they're going to be moving forward. So of course we can start with the most recent one, which I think is probably the most important one in the Obama administration, which is the IRS targeting of uh, President Obama's political enemies, uh, targeting of conservatives who he happened to disagree with. And we're not just talking about the IRS scandal in terms of, oh, they targeted some conservatives, big deal. The IRS scandal has so many scandals within the scandal that it's very hard to keep track of all of it. One of those scandals inside that scandal, I think, is the connection to the Department of Justice and the fact that the IRS was working with the Department of Justice 
to find a way to launch a criminal investigation against these Tea Party groups in order to, according to Lois Lerner, throw someone from the Tea Party movement in jail in order to send a message to all the rest of us. And that means all the rest of you. That's exactly who they were talking about. That's one thing. The other thing is now the, the cover-up that has happened since the IRS scandal uh, occurred. So not only has Lois Lerner pled the fifth twice, which, okay, it's her right to do that, um, but it's everything else that has come with that, including her missing emails. Now all of a sudden, when we're looking for the emails that, that pertain to what we're looking for, they have all the emails that were between her and her other IRS employees, but they just don't have the ones going out to the Department of Justice and the White House and the FEC, you know, conveniently. So that was one, and the second, of course, is Fast and Furious, which I covered extensively, which is kind of uh, dropped off in the headlines due to being uh, caught up in court battles. Benghazi, we still don't have answers on Benghazi. Uh, the Department of Justice monitoring the phone lines of reporters, if that wasn't bad enough. Let's not, remember, let's not forget that they did this to the Associated Press, they did this to Fox News, they did this to a whole host of reporters. But what was worse was them classifying Fox News' James Rosen as a criminal co-conspirator. And not only did the Obama Justice Department monitor James Rosen and other reporters like him, they decided they, they were going to monitor the phone lines running out to James Rosen's parents' house on Staten Island. So not only are they you know, <coughs> stepping over the line there when it comes to the criminality of doing that, uh, treating uh, reporters who are doing their job and have a very, uh, you know, I think, important job to do when it comes to preserving free speech in this country and really exposing what the government is doing. Now they're taking a look at your parents <laughs> if, you, if they disagree with what you're doing and, and, and classifying you as a co-conspirator. Kathleen Sebelius soliciting donations from companies uh, for Ob uh, soliciting donations to fund Obamacare from companies that Health and Human Services would be regulating. She did that back in 2013. So you have this government agency basically forcing these uh, companies to donate to fund Obamacare as if the taxpayer hasn't funded Obamacare enough. That was, I think, a scandal. Of course, the Veterans Affairs scandal with uh, veterans dying as a result of bureaucrats deciding that their bonuses and m ensuring that wait times looked shorter on paper was more important than the lives of people who have uh, sacrificed you know, their family time and put their lives on the line for our country. President Obama changing Obamacare whenever he feels like it, and then berating Republicans for suggesting that they change things legislatively, right, and doing it himself. Going back to Solyndra, when we spent $500 billion on a company that went bankrupt, and all of those contracts went to President Obama's campaign friends. There was a new Black Panther Party case that the Department of Justice decided to drop, despite the fact that they claimed to be all about reducing voter intimidation. The healthcare.gov rollout. Now all of a sudden today we're seeing that those emails are also missing when it comes <laughs> to finding out what happened uh, in the healthcare.gov rollout, the Obamacare rollout, how that was um, scheduled. Were there any problems going into that? I think we'd say yes. Going way back to the Pigford scandal, which was something that Andrew Breitbart always talked about. That happened under Barack Obama. And of course, here in Texas, we're now seeing what I think is a President Obama scandal with the unaccompanied minor uh, crisis that was caused by President Obama's open borders uh, DACA policies. And yet, nothing is, is really happening. And so, and then, you know, going back to the missing emails, this is, is something that we see across the board. We've seen the missing emails being used as an excuse with EPA uh, scandals, with the IRS, now with Health and Human Services. So I think missing emails, which, by the way, every single federal agency has a duty by law to save those emails for the archives by law, uh, I think that's a scandal in itself as well, considering they are violating those laws. And so when it comes to taking a look at how these scandals play out, there's one thing that is connected between all of them, and that is how the administration handles these scandals. And I, I think that they use a, it's not that they you know, accidentally deal with one or the other, they have a very detailed playbook that they use when it comes to dealing with these scandals, and I think you'll find their tactics very familiar. 
So the first thing is when the White House finds out about a new scandal, they'll play down and say, oh, we learned about this on the news, right? We just, we we just learned about this. We had no idea. Of course, the president didn't know. The second thing that they do is they blame some rogue, faraway office, some low-level employee who doesn't know what they're doing, for what happened. We saw this in Operation Fast and Furious. So that was some rogue agents back in Phoenix who just decided to give drug cartels 2,500 weapons uh, and traffic them south of the border when eventually we found out that memos addressed directly to Eric Holder discussed this issue. We saw that with the IRS scandal. You know, oh, this was a couple employees in Cincinnati. Washington, D.C. had nothing to do with this, especially, you know, high-level officials at the Department of Justice or in the IRS, low-level rogue employees. So after they blame someone else and try to distract away from D.C., they then investigate themselves. They launch an investigation for two reasons. First, to look like they actually care about getting to the bottom of the scandal. And second, to shut down questioning about answers. You'll notice that whenever the White House press, press secretary is asked questions about an ongoing investigation, they'll say, I can't comment on that because there's an ongoing investigation. <laughs> so they do that on purpose, right? They do that so they don't have to answer questions. And you'll notice that none of these scandals really have any kind of result in terms of accountability. And so that's also a way for them to say there's an ongoing investigation and for it to get out of the headlines and out of the press. The next thing that they do is they attack the investigation from Congress. After saying they wanted to work with Congress to get the bottom of something, they then attack Congress and say things like, oh, the investigation's too broad. And just recently you had the IRS Commissioner John Koskinen saying, well, these requests are just so burdensome on, on my employees. Morale is really low at the IRS. <laughs> it's, it's just so difficult to comply with these subpoenas. And it's like, oh, now you know how it feels to get audited. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the club. So then they, you know, they'll, what they'll do is they'll produce documents, say they'll produce 7,000 documents, most of which are blacked out pages, and they'll say, oh, well, we've produced 7,000 documents. What else do you want, right? And it make, they make it look like they're complying when really it's a bunch of junk that they're giving to you and then they kind of act like they're cooperating. It's the same thing with the lost emails argument. Well, we have some of the emails. We just don't have the ones that you're looking for. So that's OK, right? I mean, we, we've tried. We've tried. We can give you the ones that we have, um, that they claim that they have. And then finally, uh, after a few months goes by of the stonewalling and distracting and blaming others and covering up and attacking Congress for investigation, the White House pretends that the scandal never existed in the first place. Dude, that was like two years ago. <laughs> I mean, really, what do you expect from me? Like, really? That shows you a lot about why we're in this situation, first of all. And then the second, you know, President Obama did an interview with Chris Matthews uh, at American University uh, last December, I believe. And he was asked a question about the IRS scandal. Remember, President Obama came out and he was really angry. If this happened, he was going to get to the bottom of it. If the IRS was being used to target political opponents, it was unacceptable. And yet, six months after this scandal broke, he said, yeah, well, people find out that they're on a list and they're upset about something. I don't understand. And so they expect, you know, they, they then mock you for having the nerve to question why you would ever think that there was any wrongdoing. They don't think that you should be, you know, calling for accountability. And then, of course, the press kind of lets them get away with it. So that's kind of the playbook. And now Kevin's going to talk to you about why the Obama administration is susceptible to all of these scandals. Why is it that there are so many scandals inside the Obama administration? So yeah, there are, I would say, three things that make the Obama administration uniquely susceptible to these scandals that we've seen occur. Um, one is the unfettered faith that they have in the competency of government bureaucrats. Um, you know, Barack Obama at heart is a technocrat. He believes that society is a committed. giant laboratory and, and all you have to do enough, is get Texas the wheels and the cogs in the right place and everything will go the according to plan. Lots of resources we know that's not the case. Lots of resources in they also have to turn a failure to, their to side. address the root of the and problem. And they're being stymied by the said, fact that they once believe these scandals come out, is destiny, um, they so they see the rise of Hispanic voters in Texas, and they think, by God, it's only a matter of time before it turns to There's really nothing we can do here. In Texas, and a third is, is not the destiny. Good policy have, is destiny. That a massive, unaccountable bureaucracy is simply what we need to have 
now, in I modern this, American political life. Um, they Georgia believe is, that Louisiana you know, trade's planted into Georgia. Bureaucracy I mean, I, I like that we my all stay completely out of control. Not the humidity. We've got the Texas heat, just not the. They, I mean, they don't they have, have our humidity, this, right? That it is completely out of but, control. But uh, Texas just um, they works. They think that that's folks. just the price that we it pay works. for the welfare state. It's the price that we pay. Um, to get all these Works. great government the benefits Democrats that they put in a place, lot you know, of time um, and energy and the two to tell that I think the are really public emblematic Texas of this doesn't work. Are, and can Don't you believe your lion eyes. Scandal and the VA scandal. Don't believe your um, next door neighbor who's packing up and moving to Texas we saw for a job. Don't believe your lion eyes of your kids kind of moving to Texas that we to go to see school. For universal health care. They say, no. look, the government takes care of our veterans. Why can't the government take care of everybody? And they saw the VA as a, again, well-run bureaucracy that took care of people, that helped people. Um, and once we saw, and once the scandal broke, uh, that the VA is not this perfect machine full of, you know, well-intentioned government cogs taking care of people. Profound pleasure and honor to introduce to you again at the Red State Gathering, it's a bureaucracy the governor like of any the great other. state of it's Texas. It's where people take shortcuts. It's this where the bureaucrats are not kind of altruistic, really just interested in the public good. Um, they're people who take shortcuts. They're people who don't particularly care when they fail. And when they do fail, they cover it up. And they lie to the, uh, to, uh, the people they're supposed so the to be accountable the people of this country can lead their lives. It is my you know, profound pleasure and honor to, to introduce to you again at the Richard Nixon up here. Um, but he was one of the first to recognize how large our bureaucracy had grown. Um, and he had, there are you know, multiple quotes you can find from Nixon saying he, he, he realized how large it was, how even the President of the United States could not rein in uh, the, bureauc the bureaucracy. He could not rein in the bureaucrats. And most conservatives and most Republican presidents since then have recognized that this is a, a problem. State it's gathering. something that we have the to governor of the great it's something state that of we Texas. have to tame. Barack Obama sees a giant unfettered bureaucracy as a feature of the American political system, not a bug. He thinks that it's something, you know, all you have to do is get the right people in the right places and everything falls into place. And I think, unfortunately, <laughs> Lois Lerner is exactly the type of bureaucrat that Barack Obama wants running the IRS. She's someone who sees conservative groups applying for nonprofit tax status, and she's something who says, that looks like a problem. She called you a-holes, <laughs> too, in government emails. There's, so. there's also the, the, the example of the pure contempt that she shows <laughs> yeah. for the people that she is supposed to be serving. You know, Barack Obama sees bureaucrats as people in control of society, not people serving the people of society. Um, and Lois Lerner is, is, a, is a great example of that, and the IRS scandal is an amazing example of that. To Barack Obama and progressives, uh, a massive bureaucracy is what we need in society. Lois Lerner is something that we're supposed to need in society. You know, she's there to protect us from evil people who want to have nonprofits and want to be active in politics. She's there to protect us from that. Um, and I think that we see in the failure of the Obama administration to address these problems, the failure of them to recognize that it's not that we have you know, good-hearted servants uh, in these bureaucratic positions. They don't recognize that. They say, oh, these people just fail just like everyone else. But they don't re recognize the ramifications of what happens when government bureaucrats fail. And they don't have the insight to look at themselves and say, maybe our assumptions about bureaucracy, about bureaucrats, are wrong. They say, oh, we just need different people, and we just need to hide these failings. We need to hide the accountability. Um, so I think that, th that those two scandals, in and of themselves, are really emblematic of the ad attitude that President Obama and many progressives have about the bureaucracy. Um, that these aren't actually scandals. You know, you see it all the time in the mainstream media mm -hmm. that these are fake, sca fake scandals. I'm not sure what a real scandal would be <laughs> Can we define if, that? if these are fake <laughs> scandals. I don't, I don't, I have no clue what kind of failing the Obama administration would have to undertake uh, for the mainstream media to admit that the, there's something wrong at the heart of the Obama administration. Right. Um, but Katie, I wanted to ask you, uh, about some of the other scandals and about 
kind of Barack Obama's attitude that we've seen play out and why these, these keep happening. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I'm not a betting man, but I would not bet that there's more that's still coming down the pipeline. Yeah, and, and you know, it's very frustrating, and this is a question I get a lot of, why aren't we seeing anyone held accountable? Why is it that no one has been fired? And the truth is, really, people don't get fired under Barack Obama. They, they do not get fired. I mean, President Bush fired, you know, for no administration is perfect. But at least other administrations were willing to fire people for very serious, not just mistakes, but very bad decisions that they made uh, that were disrespectful to you know, law enforcement families when their family members are killed as a result of government programs, to American taxpayers who work really hard to get their taxes in on time, um, to our veterans who are literally dying inside of our hospitals as a result of people deciding their bonuses are more important than actually getting our veterans care. The list goes on and on. And the issue is that that non-accountability has become the status quo. And that's a very dangerous thing. Because we're not just talking about bad decisions that are made or mistakes even. We're also talking about a criminality factor here. And what I've seen over the past six years is this dangerous precedent being set that it's OK if government bureaucrats break the law because it won't be enforced. So the issue is no longer, am I breaking the law here? The issue is, it's OK if I break the law, and no one's going to send me to jail over it. There's plenty of evidence in a lot of different um, of these different forms and these different scandals of criminal wrongdoing. And yet, because we have a Justice Department that is so politically motivated, no one is ever held accountable, not for just making really bad decisions that have put people's lives in jeopardy and have caused people to lose their lives. Um, that has abused you know, the hard work and hard earned money of American taxpayers, uh, violated the rights of American citizens when it comes to especially their First Amendment rights in the IRS scandal. But we're seeing it as a, a lawless issue that a dangerous precedent is being set that as long as you work in the government and you fall in line with politically what, no matter what administration it is going forward, you don't have a problem on your hands because no one's going to enforce the law for you. So we're now seeing this difference between government and civilian life in that if you work for the government, especially in Washington, DC, you're allowed to break the law as much as you want so long as you're doing the duty of what you've been told. Whereas if you're an American citizen, you still have the obligation to obey the law. And you also have the obligation to, um, to not really question when your rights are violated. And I think that's a really serious problem. And I think that moving forward, you know, it's Again, you talked about the expansion of the bureaucracy. This is why local and state control is even more important. Because when those decisions are made at a smaller level, it's easier to hold bureaucracy accountable. Massive bureaucracy is extremely difficult to hold accountable, accountable because there are so many people, there are so many layers, there are so many regulations and laws that apply to government, but not you. And that's exactly what people like Barack Obama want, because it allows them to get away with implementing policies through government agencies that they see fit allows them to get away with violating the rights of American citizens without being held accountable. And so I think it's really important, again, moving forward, when it comes to electing people, to really take a look at how they value the rule of law and whether that rule of law is going to apply to both American citizens and government bureaucrats. And I think it's a really serious, or a serious conversation that we need to have uh, because that is at the basis of why we continue to see these scandals pop up in the Obama administration. And we can see they'll continue just in general with the federal government bureaucracy if we don't talk about what the problem is. And that's the fact that the law is not being enforced on a very basic level of accountability. Uh, Katie, just FYI for everyone, Katie literally wrote the book on one of Obama's bloodiest scandals, uh, I think is the tagline. And Katie will yes. be uh, out signing books? Yeah, I'll be signing my new book. So my new book oh, is called new book, Assault exactly. and Flattery, The Truth About the Left and Their War on Women. And I will be signing books at 5.30 out front um, after you guys are done with everything. Right. But we wanted to also take your questions. So if you guys have any questions for us for Q&A here, I think we have about 10 minutes or so. so. on the left. Um, hi, Katie. Uh, Kevin, thanks for coming. Um, Kevin, just a quick comment. Um, I, I, you're right with what you're saying. I think you're, frankly, frankly a little being 
little too kind to the president. <laughs> um, I, I, I think more in terms of line of um, what Dinesh D'Souza says and the five days from fundamentally transforming America. I think he's just doing what he wants, and he just wants to bring us down. But, but on the um, on, on the scandals, um, I was pleased to see the um, you know the, the one investigation, the Select Committee, begin on um, Benghazi. The question I have is, why don't we see more of that on IRS, on Fast and Furious, on right down the list that you were describing? Well, I'll, I'll go first. I think actually Daryl Issa has done a very good job holding the Obama administration accountable. Um, and I'm not sure how much you guys see it. We're, I'm trapped in the DC bubble, so I see the mainstream media rush to kind of try to discredit Injected serene, um, beautiful places where disorder became harmony. And it's very unfortunate. I think he's doing a really good job. Um, Democrats. Do you know how to fly though? Absolutely. Do you get to fly to the edge? Oh yeah. Clown show. Mm -hmm. You know, every committee hearing that they have, um, their investigations con are continually railroaded by Elijah Cummings and, and the other Democrats on that committee. Um, so. I do think that there are people trying to do good, trying to get to the bottom of this. I think, unfortunately, the mainstream media has been complicit with the Obama administration in um, the Democrats' railroading of these, uh, these investigations. Um, Daryl Issa has been kind of court, portrayed as a crank, uh, which is not the case. He's an incredibly dedicated public servant. Um, and I, I try not to use public servant that much, but he is actually <laughs> dedicated to holding the Obama administration accountable. Yeah, and I would add, uh, I think in terms of the select committee question that you asked, I think that there's a, a little bit of hesitancy there because unless we have the Senate, it's very difficult to actually continue forward with accountability, which is why it's so important on so many levels to win back the Senate in uh, November because if you have the Senate, you have subpoena power on the Judiciary Committee. And uh, Chuck Grassley during the Fast and Furious <coughs> scandal and through a couple other things as well, but specifically, specifically on that, was very dedicated to getting to the bottom of that and getting people to answer questions. And when you have subpoena power in the Senate, you're, you're able to get further and you're allowed to enforce the law more and it requires that these bureaucrats do respond to subpoenas. So I think that there's a little bit of hesitancy there in the sense of that they need more power, and I think that they're hoping for that to happen uh, in November. We have reached the end of the discussion. Okay. All right. Thank you Thank very you much. Guys. I appreciate yeah. it very much.